the most out of this hour. So hello everyone and thank you very much for joining us um, at this webinar to talk about the um, first tier tribunal case in Sonda and what this means for tour operators, uh, service department operators um, going forward. Um, so I, um, I'm i Laura Chip, for those of you who don't know, um, I'm a director at VATNAV um, and I specialise in TOMS VAT. Um, my panellist here, you should be able to see, is Paul Chip. Um, Paul, do you want to say a couple yeah. of words about yourself? <laughs> Good morning, my name is Paul and I am basically Laura's general dog's body. Um, so uh, if you have any questions after this webinar, um, please feel free to get in touch with me. Um, that's paul at vatnav.co.uk. Um, I will try to, is it not? Is it not? That, sorry, dot com. I do apologise. I should know my email by now. Um, yeah, no, I'm I'm basically the one that will organise uh, meetings with Laura, anything like that. So if you're unable to get hold of Laura, you will always be able to get hold of me um, and I will try and connect you up as quickly as possible. Great. So this uh, on this hour, I'm going to be doing most of the talking. And um, if um, Paul's role today is, is as normal as a supporting role but um the main thing is that um what we'd like is that if anyone's got any questions um throughout the session if you want to type those um on the the q a which should be towards the bottom left of your screen um if you type those in in that chat box then paul will sort of be looking at that and facilitating um any questions uh, at the appropriate times yeah, I think that would be really helpful um, just because we can get a feel for the type of questions that most people have got and the concerns. So, yeah, that would be really helpful to have questions throughout it to make it as interactive as possible. Great. OK, so we do have some slides um, to talk you through. Um, so let's share that now. Hopefully everyone can see on your screens. Let us know if not um, our slide pack. Um, you'll So let's try and actually get it working. Oh, there we go. OK, just taking a while. So what we're going to be talking about today is, um, first of all, we will talk you through a um, very brief overview of the benefits of TOMS for service accommodation operators. We'll then look at what the issues have been um, over the past however many years, um, we've good to five or ten years now. And um, we'll then look at the Sonda Europe Limited first tier tribunal case and how this may help surface accommodation operators going forward and then we'll look at some next steps so in terms of toms itself so the actual benefit and why do we sort of talk a lot about toms in the industry um we we obviously so i know a lot of you sort of say to me the name toms has sort of been banded around everyone's talking about it and you know people are saying oh we're getting amazing amazing benefits with toms now it We've always been reluctant, I think, to, to sort of say everyone can use TOMS and everyone's going to get a great benefit out of TOMS. Um, but in, in a lot of circumstances, it does really benefit service accommodation operators. Um, reason being that if you look at the normal VAT rules, um, for you guys doing service accommodation, you'd have to pay VAT on the full selling price, which is 20%. Um, you have very little recoverable VAT on your purchases um, because your main purchase um, is a, a sort of residential lease or a company let uh, from a landlord, and that's exempt from VAT. So normally what you're looking at is, you know, a lot of operators go from being not VAT registered to being VAT registered, and you're losing a large chunk of your margin um, because you're you're not able to recover anything um, extra as in your VAT registration, but you're having to pay 20% of, you know, your, your whole selling price to HMRC, um, which in some cases can be a large chunk of the margin. And a lot of businesses sort of say to me, look, this is really difficult. Um, and in some cases, it sort of completely screws up the whole business model. Um, so the tour, tour operators margin scheme, um, TOMS, is... Um, obviously meant, to, meant for tour operators, um, as the name suggests. Um, but because of the, the, the way it works, um, a lot of serviced accommodation operators can fall within the scope of TOMS. Um, and when that happens, um, under the rules, 
the um, the standard rated VAT is still due, but on the direct margin made only rather than the full selling price. So if we look at before when we're using the normal VAT rules and we're having to pay 20 percent on the full selling price. Now we're at paying 20 percent, but only on the margin made. Um, so it, it gives a massive saving in a lot of cases. Um, now, under the TOMS rules, you can't recover any input of that on the direct cost of the, the service itself. But what we mean by direct cost under TOMS is literally the cost of the travel service. Um, now, in, in the case for, for service accommodation, the direct cost of the travel service is the direct cost of the accommodation, which is your residential lease or your company let which doesn't have VAT on it anyway. So in, in terms of using TOMS, we're not losing out anything in terms of recoverability of input VAT um, because there isn't any to recover in the first place. Um, Laura, can I just interrupt just a second? We just had a quick question come in. Um, and very briefly, can you just explain to us how we determine the direct margin, just very briefly? Yeah, so the direct margin um, <clears throat> is literally what we're looking at with TOMS. Gross selling price is whatever you get from your customer. Um, the gross margin is, is basically the cost of the rent itself. There's nothing else that can really be included um, within that. Now, we do have um, a sort of grey area over whether cleaning and linen charges can be included as well um, in the cost of sales to sort of deduct off the margin. Um, in, in my point of view, it doesn't really matter either way. Um, if cleaning and linen is included in the direct cost of sale um, in order to kind of reduce that margin, then that's fine. We have less output of that payable. Um, but if your um, if if your cleaning and linen um, includes VAT on it, you can't recover that as a direct cost. So I think it, it doesn't really matter. I think there's an argument either way as to whether you include cleaning and linen as a direct cost uh, to come off the margin. Um, and I think it probably depends which one you want to do. It probably depends on whether you're ordinarily incurring input VAT on on those charges in the first place. Um, but yeah, and I think the maybe a follow up question then is how do we how do we determine the the direct cost given that we're sort of getting from customers each um, on a sort of nightly basis and we're paying rent on a monthly basis? Well, the, the Tom's calculation is actually an annual calculation. We're not going to go into the workings of it today, um, but um, in terms of the actual mechanics of it, we don't look at TOMS on a, a sort of per sale basis. So um, it's probably not as easy to sort of explain how to get a direct TOMS margin on a sort of per sale or a per night uh, basis. Think, um, sorry to interrupt. Um, if anybody's interested, if you look on our YouTube channel, we've actually already done a video on the TOMS calculation. So that might be useful for people. Mm. Yeah, and that, that will sort of talk more about the sort of Tom's life cycle and mechanics. Um, but yeah, we're not going to get into that bit today. But yeah, in terms of the the direct margin, um, we're looking at really the gross selling price, um, the income received from customers minus the, the cost of the rent and um and yeah, cleaning and linen if if you would if you would like to include it. Uh, as I said, there's an argument either way. Um yeah, so in terms of uh, so other VAT recovery, so so that's the um, the direct cost itself. You can still recover VAT on your overheads. Um, obviously, as we've said, agents' commissions don't come into direct costs. They're an indirect cost. The VAT on those can be recovered. Um, the only sort of disadvantages for service accommodation providers is that you can't issue a VAT invoice to your customer. Um, and also you get no reduction in the VAT rate for long-stay accommodation. Um, now, this means that with, in terms of the invoices to customers, this means that TOMS is often a disadvantage if all your customers are corporate businesses. Um, corporate businesses will ordinarily expect to receive a VAT invoice. Um, under TOMS, you can't issue one to your customer and your customer can't recover the VAT. So it's actually not a great position if you know a lot of your services are sold to corporate businesses. Um, Often it also is if many of you provide accommodation for periods of over 28 days, after 28 days in the normal rules, you get a 4% rate, essentially. You don't get that on the TOMS. So if you if a lot of your sales are um, sort of long stays, um, then TOMS, again, may not be beneficial. Um, but for those of you who are um, selling sort of short term accommodation, less than 28 days, mainly to leisure um, travellers, 
then TOMS is often a really good um, benefit. So here is a really quick comparison between TOMS and normal rules. So let's say we've got an annual turnover of 120,000 and annual cost of all rents is 78,000. The 120 is VAT inclusive um, and the cost of rent is um, well VAT inclusive, but VAT exempt as well. So there's no VAT there. Under the normal VAT rules, we've got to pay output VAT of 20,000. And that's because we've got a gross annual turnover of 120,000. Um, we get the in terms of, to get from the gross to the VAT, we, we sort of carve the VAT out of that. Um, so it's not times by 20 percent. It's times 20 over 120 to get the VAT. Um, which gives us um, 20,000 of output VAT paid under normal rules. Uh, we have no input VAT to recover on the direct cost of rent because it is VAT exempt. Um, now under TOMS, we've got, um, we don't pay VAT on the full selling price, we pay it on the margin only. Um, now our margin is, in this case, we've decided to not include cleaning and linen as our direct cost um, of sale. Um, so we have um, annual turnover of 120, cost of rent of 78, that so gives us a margin of 42,000. Um, so again, our output VAT charge there is 7,000 um, because that's the, the VAT out of the gross of 42. Um, we can't recover any input VAT in this situation because, well, firstly, there's no input VAT to recover, um, but also we can't recover it um, under TOMS. So in terms of these costs, we have um, a, a large difference, as you can see, in the output of that payable. Now, although this example is made up, it's actually quite um, similar to a lot of the sort of margins and percentages we see in real life. So that is a genuine saving um, that could be achieved for many of you for using TOMS. So um, obviously a lot uh, worth um, looking at going forward. In terms of when TOMS applies, and this is what we're, we're trying to do here is, is sort of give you an idea of what the issues are and what they have been going for um, in, in the past. So TOMS only applies if these four conditions are satisfied. Firstly, there must be a supply of travel services. Now, in general, travel services include accommodation, assuming it's provided for tourists or visitors, alongside of a load of other things that are not particularly relevant here, so we're not going to go into them. Um, the supplier must be acting in their own name. Um, so you must buy in the accommodation and sell it on um, in your own name. Um, we sometimes look at contracts where people are instead a managing agent, um, but they're not actually um, buying and selling accommodation in their own name. They are merely assisting the, the landlord um, with, with can managing. I, can mm -hmm. I just jump in on here? We've just had a question come in. And I think this is probably bang on the point. Um, the question's from Graham, and he says, um, how does this work as an agency? Does it make a difference if you're an agent or principal? I think that probably fits in quite well with this particular part you're saying. Yeah, exactly. So I think if um, <clears throat> if you're an agent, then TOMS doesn't apply. But if you're an agent, it also means you don't really have the same issue. Um, as an agent, you're not buying you're not buying and selling the accommodation. You will be earning a fee or a commission um, from... Um, your services which I'm sure are very good but are not the same as buying and selling accommodation um in which case the the VAT payable in that situation is only due on the commission or fee itself anyway rather than the full selling price that doesn't really have the same disadvantage um of of having to pay VAT on on the full selling price um under non-TOMS rules so if you're a managing agent um then there's not really a particular need for TOMS um and it obviously doesn't apply anyway um the reason most people don't act as managing agent is normally because of their relationships with the landlord the landlord don't was, doesn't want to be dealing with the um you know uh, the guests contractually um directly but um but yeah in terms of the the difference is all contractual um some people your circumstances may be better as, as managing agent but in most cases people want to sort of have control over the the apartments um, and their sales on so um it's it's not as, as appropriate to act as agent but um but yeah it's obviously a great idea too um the third point is that the services must be acquired from a third party and supplied without material alteration or further processing now we will come into that um, in a bit more detail, a lot more detail, I'm sure, um, further on in this call. Um, and the service must be supplied for the benefit of a traveller. 
and really what that means I'm not going to go into the um the the case law on on this point but um, all that really means is if you're selling to the person direct um it will usually be for the benefit of a traveler um and it must be someone who's obviously a traveler so it's not they're not staying at home it's not a residential accommodation um so yeah so how this fits in with service departments um Accommodation as a travel service if it, if it is held out for use by tourists, travellers or visitors. Um, and normally we'll see that this type of accommodation is in direct competition with hotels. Um, I think that's fairly um, easy to, uh, to sort of prove here. Um, a lot of the time you look at um, travel agents and you see service departments advertised very closely alongside hotels, providing a lot of the same services. Um, so, yeah, Tom's only applies whether the supplier is a principal or undisclosed agent in the sale of a service. Um, and, and again, I think I would ask you if you don't know if you're a principal or not. Normally, it's obvious if you if you have a, a sort of contract with a landlord where you're paying a monthly rent or an annual rent um, and you yourself are then um, portioning it up into nightly bases for uh, for your guests um, and you're handling the guests and have contracts with the guests it's quite obvious that you're acting as principal but if you don't know or you want to have a look whether an agency arrangement is possible it's all about contracts a lot of our clients get really fed off with me saying contracts contracts to contracts but it is all based on contracts um so yeah this kind of difference um you need to look at contracts, but normally people who have leases with landlords are going to be principal. Um, there's no question about it because that isn't a, a thing for agent arrangements. Um, and yes, yeah, so the services are for the direct benefit of the traveller when the traveller is the, the customer themselves purchasing the service. Um, but obviously we haven't <laughs> talked about material alteration. And this is really the, the main point within the Sonder case and within all the issues that we've seen from HMRC um, in the past. Um, it is this point that is really important for service department operators. Um, now, under Tom's, in order for it to apply, you must buy your services in and sell them on without being material materially altered. Now, the problem with this has always been that there's no legal definition of material alteration. Um, and I think the, the the problem with anything that is not legally defined and that there's not a great body of law on is that everyone is sort of free to interpret it how they want. That means the, the customer themselves, that means HMRC, that means advisors such as uh, us. Um, everyone can sort of argue their own point um, and, and it, it's sort of, there's no guarantee, there's no certainty with anything. Um, in the past, at HMRC, and I think that those of you who I've talked to, that clients of ours, I think we, we've sort of said um, numerous times that we've been really frustrated with HMRC um, because they sort of have this, this one small paragraph in their, their overall Tom's notice, which basically says that if you... Um, if you're responsible for the fabric, for the maintenance to the fabric of the building and repairs and maintenance, to the general building, um, then you are um, materially altering the service. Now, that's all it says. So it's been really frustrating in a lot of ways um, to sort of get a good picture of material alteration, because that's all we've got from HMRC. We've got pretty much nothing in, in general law. And HMRC have basically said in the past that if you so in order to have materially altered a supply of um, service accommodation, you have to um, be responsible for the maintenance to the fabric of the buildings. That is the sort of the walls, the doors, the roof, the floors. Um, and you have to be responsible for repairs and maintenance to the general property. Now, taking that face value, you know, you can say, well, great, you know, if we don't. If, as long as we don't have to do that and we can put in our contracts that we've got no responsibility for that, does that mean we're in Tom's? And I think a lot of operators have been sort of comfortably plodding along sort of saying, OK, brilliant, we're not doing any of that. We must be in Tom's. It's absolutely fine. Um, we've had rulings in the past, um, it was a good five years ago or so, just based on that with officers saying, yeah, OK, that, that makes sense. I agree with you. Um, and that's all we've had to go on for a long time. Um, but the thing is, obviously, service accommodation is becoming more and more popular. There are more and more operators out there doing it. So HMRC is almost like I've just decided, hang on a minute, um, this is um, a bit too close for our liking. Um, 
we're not liking the the amount of VAT that you guys are paying. It seems to be too little. So we're going to invent all these new um, areas of material alteration. So um, which which we're not going to put in our public guidance at all or anywhere else. We're just going to tell people who who dare to approach us with tons um, about um, in order to reject them. So we've had in, in, in various cases we've had um, HMRC say that. Um, you can't use TOMS because of material alteration, because you have furnished um, the apartment. Um, they said you can't use it because you pay for utilities and other bills. Um, we've had people at had HMRC say that um, quite clearly um, that if you have a long lease of more than 12 months with the landlord, um, then you can't use TOMS because that's material alteration. Um, if you carry out repairs and maintenance of any type, um HMRC say again it's material alteration we've even had ridiculous um things like we've looked in the contracts and someone's have said oh we'll clean the windows and HMRC say yeah but the windows are part of the fabric of the building so you cleaning the windows is maintenance to the fabric of the building you sort of think you know for god's sake I don't think that's what they mean (laughs) I I don't think that's really what's meant by the maintenance of the fabric of the building window cleaning I think there was another contract we had where I think it was an old contract and it was talking about chimneys in the middle of the property and I'm thinking well that's clearly not the case it's a property in the middle of Leeds it's a, a sort of you know new build apartment there's no chimneys and but HMRC is saying yeah but it says it in the contract so the chimneys are part of the fabric so it got ridiculous um and I I, I you know I think it's I've been quite vocal on the fact that I think HMRC's attitude has been quite ridiculous to this because they've been so inconsistent and it's been frustrating for for everyone involved. Um, Yes, the other point there is that um, if you have staff or other services at the property, HMRC have said that you are um, uh, too involved in the service. So there's been all these points where the thing is that, I mean, do I disagree with these? Not sure. I think, to be honest, I think my own definition of material alteration is... I agree with some of the points, the the furniture, for example, I think, you know, personally, I think if I if I bought a, a sort of blank apartment in from a landlord, um, I think that's a very different proposition. If if you invited a guest into that and called it holiday accommodation, I think they'd sort of raise their eyebrows. So I think personally, I know furniture for me is. Yeah, possibly an alteration of, of, of materiality, but um, I think. No, I- can I sorry just jump in? Yeah, we've actually had a question on that. And one of the questions was I'm a service, they've basically said I'm a service department provider. When I buy furniture and repair the boiler for the rental property, can I claim VAT back on these items? And I guess that's sort of two questions is number one, would that be considered material alteration? And then number two, obviously, can we claim the VAT back on that? Hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting point. Um, because I, I think and we'll get we'll get into that, I think, probably in a bit more detail in terms of the furniture point, because um, I think, you know, as I said, my my impression is that buying in furniture um, to necessarily furnish the apartment is is quite a big change. Um, but obviously it's not about me. Um, it's about what is it's decided in the court of law. And um, at the moment, um, I think in the in the, the case of Sonder, um, that will seem to be acceptable. So we, we will get on to that. But um but yeah, and in terms of the input of that claim, I think that that is an interesting question um, in that we, we need to consider and we will do it a bit later on. Um, but the answer is, is, again, it's probably it depends. But um, I think I think I'm probably veering towards yes. Um, but I think the, the the trade-off for that is is that if you're recovering input VAT on anything, it means it's not going towards your margin for Tom's. So I think there's probably a bit of leeway here. Um, but yes, I think it's... Um, it's probably something to look at for each individual calculation and, and, and form an argument on. Yep. Um, OK, so, yes, in terms of the issues in in using TOMS, um, I, I think I've sort of said this and I'm going to be vocal about it again, just because it, it has really annoyed me. Um, the HMRC has just been wholly in, unclear and inconsistent on this point for many years. We've had businesses that are doing exactly the same thing and yet one HMRC officer will say one thing. And another entirely different officer would give a completely different ruling. And it's not fair to businesses um, because especially when so many of businesses are using TOMS, the ones that have had it denied for, for some nondescript reason um, are losing, are losing, you know, market share. It's, it's really not fair. I think the, um, you know, I, I personally wouldn't mind if, think if there was a, if there was a really clear um, brief from HMRC on this point. 
um, that is strict, but, you know, sets out exactly what is meant. Um, I, I don't think I'd mind as much, but it's, it's not, they haven't done anything public at all. It's just been, you know, you only find out when you, you sort of get a slap on the wrist. And that's just not that's not how this is meant to go. HMRC are not meant to operate that way. And I just think it's quite disgraceful personally. So I'm quite glad to uh, to make sure that, um, that in this case, we've actually got a, a good answer out of the tribunal. Um, so yeah, a lot of businesses have had to stay clear of tribunal before because, you know, a lot of operators are I'm not going to say you're small, but you're not um, normally sort of massive um you know huge other companies at the sort of top of um the the sort of you know the uk industry in general um and you don't have hundreds of thousands to spare um going to tribunal so we're obviously very grateful for sonder europe um to for, for taking it this far and um and obviously very extremely grateful to the barrister who um who got this through um but um this is something obviously that um, we, we want to discuss today. I know we've we've done a lot of uh, talking, um, but let's actually get to the case itself. So in the circumstances of Sonda, um, the company rented exempt accommodation from landlord um, on a long lease. I think this didn't say in the decision, but I believe it was three to five years on average. Um, in the contracts, they agreed to restrict their supplies to residential use. Um, the exact um, restrictions was to use the property only as a service department for the residential occupation of one or more occupiers. Um, the properties could be furnished or unfurnished um, when they were bought in from landlords. Um, when Sonda furnished the property, it did so with its own distinct style. Um, sometimes it carried out cosmetic changes such as decorations and painting a wall, for example. It never made any changes which would have altered the fabric or structure of the apartment. So not moving any walls, not changing the windows. Um, and this was prohibited in contracts. Um, it was responsible for damages and general upkeep of the property. Um, in in general, in context, there was sort of 20k um, spent on repairs and maintenance of you know, rents of 1.5 million. So we're not talking, you know, crazy amounts of um, repairs, um, but obviously a sort of occasional ad hoc um, services. There was no mention that I could see of who pays utilities um, or of anything to do with staff. Um, so that must be left uh, for another day. Um, so in the onward supply to guests, Sonda didn't, didn't market itself as a tour operator or travel agent. The apartments were offered on a self-catering basis with no additional services. Um, their sales to guests were an average of five nights. Um, it didn't have any staff itself at the premises um, and guests checked in and out um, via an online process and access box. But it did have a dedicated helpline, 24-7 helpline for guests with any questions um, that Sonda itself would try and um, deal with um, as much as possible. Um, and they did have a third party house cleaning, housekeeping and cleaning service um, and linen pre and post state only, as is the norm uh, for many of you. So Sonda maintained it was an acting in a similar capacity um, as a tour operator and providing tourist accommodation services without material alteration. And thus its services fell within TOMS. HMRC came back and said that it couldn't use TOMS because firstly, it was not a tour operator within the meaning for Tom's purposes, um, which we thought was kind of, I mean, uh, obviously an, an, a, a point, I mean, in terms of it's not a tour operator, um, but we also thought it was a bit odd for HMRC to say that because um, HMRC themselves have often applied to Tom's really strictly. Um, so a lot of our clients using Tom's are not tour operators at all. They're events companies, they're charities, they're schools. Um, so we thought it was an odd point because, um, you know, if, if HMRC had lost that point, we'd just be submitting claims for the next couple of years um, for all the people that were not tour operators who had been paying VAT on um, on the margin made on um, European services prior to Brexit. So anyway, um, we don't know why they took that point. They did. And obviously, great that we've got it cleared up. Um, second point was that even if it was a tour operator, it materially altered the services such that Tom's would not apply. So the court was asked to determine whether Sonder was a tour operator in the first case, and if so, whether it materially altered the services. OK, and the first point, uh, was Sonder a tour operator? Um, yeah, as I said, we expected it to be one. The court didn't really spend a great deal of time and effort on this. Um, the the point that HRC perhaps either missed or didn't, didn't want to, uh, to focus on too much is that under UK law, 
Um, TOMS applies to tour operators, travel agents and any other person providing for the benefit of travellers services of any kind commonly provided by tour operators or travel agent. So we told Sonna didn't actually need to be a tour operator itself. It just needed to make sure it was providing services that would typically be provided by a tour operator. Um, yeah, and the court basically said, we're not really sure why HMRC don't think this is the case. Um, they are clearly providing accommodation for on a short term basis for tourists and visitors. An average of five nights is clearly short term. The people using the accommodation are clearly not doing it residentially um, for five nights. Um, and, and it was quite obvious that a tour operator can can often provide this type of accommodation. Um, so. They sort of said, we're not actually sure we understand HMRC's point, um, but in any case, we don't agree. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it wasn't a huge surprise to us that this was dealt with quickly, but I think it was quite a relief for um, businesses and other industries who um, were getting quite alarmed, um, thinking that, you know, TOMS might not apply. Um so I think then in the um, the next point, which is obviously the um, the more pressing issue, um, did Sonder materially alter the services? Um, so, yeah, firstly, um, the one sort of point that's sort of been quite key throughout the whole case is that it related to a period of time when the UK was still within the EU. We hadn't Brexited yet. Um, and there's no concept of material alteration in the TOMS law um, for, for the EU. Um, it, it doesn't say anything about that. It just sort of says in, in terms of providing uh, travel services for, um, for, for visitors or travellers or customers, whichever um, language you look at it in. Um, there's no there's no particular you know point on that. So I think in, in terms of uh, one of the points that was looked at in the decision was actually are HMRC even allowed to sort of say that? And I think that was a, uh, something that the, the judge said he would look at, um, but only if it, it was relevant um, in the end. Um, secondly, which um, made me very pleased, is that the court made it very clear that HMRC's paragraph in its notice 7095 has absolutely no relevance to the case. Um, the court noted that there were several parts of, of the same notice that were um, had the force of law, but that paragraph was not it. Um, so I think the judge sort of said, I find this of no relevance or something similar. So I was quite pleased about that personally, because I, I do think you know that paragraph about the, the maintenance of the fabric of the building is just... Uh, yeah, very frustrating. So they basically focused on what actually does material alteration mean? Um, HMRC had firstly said that if you convert um, a supply of exempt residential accommodation into a supply of taxable short term accommodation, it must mean the nature of the service has changed because the VAT liability has changed. Um, and a second point they, they sort of said was that adding cosmetic changes to the apartment must be material in alteration because what the apartment looked like prior to um, Sonder's involvement was very different to what it looked like after their involvement. So the court, as we know now, the court disagreed with both of these points for the following reasons. So in terms of the, um, the exempt residential lease being converted into short term taxable accommodation, um, and, and I was, I have to admit, quite uncomfortable with this point in terms of the, the change from an exempt residential contract to a taxable um, supply of um, tourist accommodation. Um, but what the court said, and which I, I do completely agree with, um, is that there are actually quite a few examples in, in other areas of presiding case law um, where a change in the VAT liability was made in order to form a TOM supply. So, for example, there were exempt supplies of um, education. Um, there are also some other supplies in, in other areas of EU law of exempt accommodation. Um, we obviously have zero rated transport um, in the UK, which is converted into a, um, a taxable TOM supply. Um, so the point about um, that change in VAT liability cannot be in point for TOMS. So what this means is that buying in an exempt residential lease from a landlord and converting it into short term taxable um, accommodation cannot be material alteration in the court's mind. Um, it said there's no requirement in the law for the in the law for the purchase to be in exactly the same state um, as the sale. And they also said that based on this, it can't be the material alteration can't be the sort of terms of supply. It has to be the alteration of the supply itself. So whether something supplied for a year or two weeks cannot be material alteration 
unless the actual substance of the thing has changed. So I think that was that made me feel a lot more comfortable um, about the the lease duration point. Um, I think I've always in the past or said to everyone, look, I'd I prefer you to have a shorter lease as possible. Um, and we've looked at a lot of people sort of having leases around the 12 month mark or having sort of rolling leases, which I still think is a good idea. And we'll get on to that. Um, but I think the obviously the, the case has said um, that longer leases does not mean that Tom's can't apply, which is um, obviously really good news. And in terms of the cosmetic changes, um, Again, the court disagreed with uh, with this. Um, they said material alteration or further processing must refer to more than minor changes or processes which do not affect the fundamental character of the particular goods or services, the accommodation. In order to be excluded from TOMS, I considered the alteration and processing must change the goods or services supplied so that what the set, what is supplied for the tour operator cannot be described in the same terms as the items acquired. So I guess here... Um, arguably that's the case I mean, one is exempt residential accommodation the other is um you know taxable holiday accommodation but um it's still accommodation it's still accommodation in an apartment um overall so i think what they're saying there is that anything that material alteration has to be something that pretty much can't be changed or has to be worked on um, a lot more to be put back in the original condition. So, for example, moving a wall, extending a property would be material changes to an, an accommodation um, property. So, um, so what can we conclude from this? Um, so we can firstly conclude that purchasing a long lease and converting into smaller durations for guests does not prevent the use of TOMS, which is great news for many of you, because I know that that is... The, the point about the um you know the the lease is being three to five years i know a lot of you want to have longer leases and your landlords want to have longer leases um so that does not prevent the use of toms furnishing a property or providing other cosmetic changes does not prevent the use of toms um so again i think as i said i'm not particularly comfortable with this point um but under sonda of course um, if this decision remains and, and we'll get on to that, um, then that is, is sort of what the court has decided. Um, but carrying out any structural alterations to the fabric of the building does prevent the use of TOMS. So I would sort of take that to, to mean, and, and HMRC will jump on this point, I'm sure. So I would take that to be as kind of strict as possible. So, yeah, you might clean a window, um, but don't change the window pane, for example, <laughs> um, you know. Anything to do with the door? Are you going to replace the door if the door needs repair? No, the landlord should do that because the door is part of the um, the structure of the property. Even though these things, again, may not seem material, um, I think in this kind of case, we need to completely err on the side of caution. Um, so anything that you're planning to do that actually changes part of the structure of the property, I would probably say don't still. <laughs> I mean, I always said don't before, but um, but yeah, now I would say that that still isn't particularly great. Um, and, yeah, what can we not conclude from this? Um, there was no comment in the decision about the provision of utilities or other bills. Um, my guess, given the um, the arrangement that's happened um, between Sonda and its landlords on other points, my guess is that Sonda probably did pay utility bills. Um, I think it'd be quite odd. Um, if quickly jump in on that. When you've, um, you've put utilities and other bills, um, one of the questions that we've had coming in is um, in regard to council tax, I believe um was it business yeah about rates so i presume i presume council tax yeah yeah exactly same same point so utilities other bills rent rates that type of sorry not rent obviously um rates um yeah treated in the same way so again the the, the original point to toms is that um what you buy in so it, with toms what we're looking at historically is a tour operator could be sitting in any country of the world and always click a button saying buy, sell, um, you know, holiday lets and transport and whatever else it might be. There's no real physical involvement from the tour operator. Um, if you're the, the more you add. So if you go in and put an item of furniture somewhere, you're physically being involved in the property. And I think that kind of, you know, it's not the purpose of Tom's really. And I think um, if, if you then sort of having to pay the the rent and the tv license and the wi-fi and the utilities that also isn't 
it wasn't the strict purpose of Tom's, but obviously this case has, has said otherwise on on things that we had taken with caution before, but it hasn't said anything about bills. Um, but yes, and that would include um, rates and everything else. So yeah, my my impression, given um, the other things within the Sonder contract, um, is that it probably did pay bills because yeah, it'd be weird if it it you know it, it did the furniture but not the bills but um I couldn't see um from my reading of um utility in the decision so I'm sort of going to be cautious at, at the time being um there was no particular comment about the use of staff um mm. it didn't seem to really be a big deal either way so I think we could perhaps read into that that um you know having staff is not a particular you know red flag um but obviously Sondra itself didn't have any staff at the property they just had a sort of mm. dedicated helpline um there so there was nothing um in that point um company let contracts obviously weren't discussed um Sonda itself had residential AST style contracts with its landlords um so um obviously company let contracts weren't, weren't discussed there's no reason I can see why um the same application couldn't be made to company let contracts um but obviously that is something that Sonder case hasn't told us specifically um and in terms of the level of repairs and maintenance um I wonder if there was any significance there again in terms of the the way the decision was announced um it, it seems like it wasn't um entirely significant but obviously the it did mention the the levels of repairs and maintenance and it, it showed that it was a very small amount compared to the um the actual you know, amount of rent uh, in a year. So I do wonder if that had been a lot more, um, whether a different sort of analysis may have been carried out. Um, so where does this leave us? Yeah, I think there's, obviously it's great news uh, for a start. Um, it was, I'm not going to lie, quite a surprise to me. Um, I thought, I thought Sunder would, would have been on the first point in that they were, you know, the fact that they were not at all operator um, under the classic sense of the word, I thought that would be fine. I thought that um, they would be doing too much to um, to sort of, you know, say it's uh, not material alteration. Um, so I'm surprised, but obviously very pleased about the decision. Um, and um, and yeah, I think it was, I think most of us are surprised actually, um, but nonetheless, um, you know, obviously very pleased with the decision. Um, HMRC have a number of different areas of, um, you know, uh, moves going forward. Um, the first one is um, to appeal the decision. Um, they may, do, may choose to do that. There are a number of cases backed up behind this one. Uh, I don't know how many, but um, yeah. definitely a, a good number. Um, so there's a lot of money involved for HMRC on this. Um, but obviously, uh, you know, as, as things go on, costs stack up and it, it may be that HMRC choose to not to move this on this one and sort of accept the decision here um in the hope of of doing uh of taking another route um we should know within the next couple of months it must be 56 days to lodge an appeal um so we should know sort of fairly shortly um whether that's likely to be the case or not um the other thing is and on this particular case is that there was a number of issues a number of mentions even sorry within the case itself about um the case being pre-brexit so there are a number of areas where the judge said I must rely on EU law precedent um, because I'm bound by it over this time period. Um, now, whether or not the decision would be different if uh, we were in a post-Brexit world, um, from reading the decision and from, you know, looking at the um, the points in it as, as to why it was made, um, I'm not sure it would for a number of reasons is that the the concept of material alteration doesn't even appear in UK law uh, sorry in EU law it only appears in UK law um and I think the the cases that um were looked at um within the decision a lot of them were um ECJ cases um but I think there there was enough that the judge mentioned that was purely based on his own interpretation on the sort of ordinary meaning of material alteration um and the the fact that it was a uk concept which which means that we're sort of fairly comfortable on this um the other point it's been mentioned a few times in general as to whether the uk can continue to rely on eu law and must continue to rely on eu law and obviously it's a it's not a an easy um it's not an easy answer um in general i think the um it's never happened before that anyone's um left the eu um, but obviously, 
cases in the ECJ must continue to have quite a lot of weight um, post Brexit. Um, the other good point about this case is that the the judge um, in it is the most senior tribunal judge um, that we have. So um, it would be if HMRC did choose to appeal to an upper tribunal, um, it would be, I suppose, quite you know, it wouldn't be as easy for a less senior judge to come along and and disagree with this one. So, in terms of the the case itself, I think we are cautiously, but you know very optimistically um, saying that we can definitely use quite a lot of the points that came out of it um, in in your cases uh, going forward. Um, The reason I've mentioned all these points is because it still doesn't give everyone a sort of blanket approach to just kind of go and apply TOMS to everything. And I think we've had a lot of people emailing us this week sort of saying, oh, does that mean we can now use TOMS in this situation and that situation? And the answer is it it must become a lot less risky to use TOMS in this situation, that situation or whatever else you might want to do. But it's still not giving everyone the sort of blanket go ahead to sort of do whatever you want. And we still sort of think there there can be things done to to make sure the risk um, of any sort of backfiring um, to to be minimised. I think... um, you know, a lot of the a lot of what we're doing at the moment with with businesses uh, is using this sort of two company approach um, where one company does the, um, you know, a lot of the background work. So the furnishing, the paying of utility bills, um, et cetera. Um, and then a sale is made from that company to the, the sort of main operator. Um, so once the operator sort of has this come in, um, it's now in a more complete state to, um, to sort of sell on um and and there's very little um, in terms of material alteration or any alteration that the operator does um i don't see a particular reason why those arrangements shouldn't continue um i think it gives that um extra bit of um comfort even with the, the sonder case saying that you know things like furnishings and and leasing um is not now as much in point um, there's, as I've said, a number of risk areas. There is the the possibility of appeal um, from HMRC. Um, there's a possibility of HMRC arguing that post Brexit um, we'd get a different result. Um, so I guess the, the point is, why would we take those risks when we sort of do quite a few things to make, you know, this sort of two company um, approach or whatever else you may be doing to sort of alleviate risks? Why would you stop? Um, so I suppose there there is that point. Um, the other thing is um, perhaps where if I was HMRC, I would go, um, is seek to just change the law going forward. Um, You know, one of the things that came out of the case was that back in those days, we had to rely on EU law. Now HMRC don't have to rely on anything because we've left the EU. So could they just sort of say, okay, well, you know, in a nice possible way, sod it. (laughs) We're not going to bother looking at the past anymore, but we don't want anyone to use TOMS going forward. Um, So we're just going to change the UK law on TOMS to say it has to apply to tour operators or something. Um, And I think in some countries, um, you actually have to have a particular certification of a tour operator, um, not for TOMS purpose, but in general. But those countries will only allow um, those companies to use TOMS. So would HMRC do something similar? Would HMRC just seek to sort of change the law on TOMS and say, I don't know, you have to provide more than one service or you have to provide a service with the same VAT liability. They could do quite a lot going forward. Um, obviously, if that does happen, it won't be quick. Um, it won't be something that, you know, they're going to introduce tomorrow. It, there is a process for, for law changes, which is definitely not overnight. Um, but um, but yeah, I think if it was me, that would probably be where, where I would go because it, it's it's an easier win. Um but uh, yes, we, we don't know for sure. Um, but I think for the time being, um, I would just, you know, obviously we are quite risk averse anyway as as a um, as a company. We don't want you to take any unnecessary risks. That's not our style. We want you to get the best position. So I think we we sort of say as an air of caution. But yes, I think there's a lot more um, scope um, and flexibility. Um, so how could the decision affect your business? Um, so, yeah, we'd advise businesses to continue to ensure the purchase of the lease from the landlord prop co is around 12 months duration where possible. If you're at the point where sort of saying, well, we actually can't do that, um, it's not going to work for us. And your lease is sort of two, three years. Then I'd say on the back of Sonder, there is still a risk. But 
based on this case, if HMRC came and pulled you up and said, well, you can't use TOMS because your leases are two to three years long, um, then I think Sonder, you could always point to Sonder and sort of say, look, there's a case that says you're not correct on this. Um, so again, you may have a battle, you may have HMRC using arguments such as, I don't know, your circumstances aren't the same, or you know, you've um you've uh we've left the EU. Um, but you know, I think you'd still have a valid argument. But yes, it's not perhaps still ideal. Um, we'd probably say to favour an AST style contract over a company let, just because Sonder used an AST um contract. Yeah. Um, we would advise, again, your contracts restrict permitted use to using the property only as a service department for the residential occupation or, or one or more occupiers. The exact same uh, sentence that Sonda had. Um, and obviously to not make any structural changes to property um, and as much as possible limit the additions of furniture and other cosmetic changes. But obviously you have flexibility there now um, since Sonda. So, yeah, so we would also advise limit repairs and maintenance ideally um don't do any of this and have the sort of two company approach where the the other company the prop co would would do the repairs and maintenance um again utility bills weren't mentioned um we would say again i, I would imagine Sonda probably did pay them but didn't mention it either way um but yeah so again that isn't that is one to perhaps avoid as possible um and avoid having um, a reliance and staff at the properties um, but obviously, with all these things, I think when we we spoke to a lot of you um, over the previous few years, um, we were sort of saying that you need to do everything it needs to be watertight. I think Sonda just gives us a lot of flexibility. So you may, for example, out of all these points we've just mentioned, you may ha meet all of them, but have leases of three years. Now, if that's the case, I'd probably say to you, OK, based on Sonda, I think you're OK. Or you may be able to do all of this perfectly apart from you pay utility bills. And again, we sort of say, well, there is a risk, but based on on the Sonda and, and the sort of points in the decision, it's a good and arguable case. Mm -hmm. So I think it is just there is flexibility, um, but we still want to ensure, you know, as least risk for your business as possible. Yeah. Um, so the other point we've had is that a lot of businesses that we've spoken to before who we've sort of said, look, under your current circumstances, it's not going to work for Tom's because of what we know HMRC have been saying. I think we had a few questions from them this week saying, where does that leave us? Can we now use Tom's? So I think personally, if if you just if you if you basically never used Tom's before, you don't really meet the or you didn't really meet the conditions before Sunday. Can I just interrupt? So um one of the questions actually today has been um we've got a client on the standard VAT scheme. Um, how do they access the Tom scheme and do the two schemes run side by side? Okay. Um, no. <laughs> so I think you, if you fall within Tom's, you're in Tom's. Um, if you don't fall within Tom's, you're not. I think the question is obviously, do you fall within Tom's? And that's not the easy answer. You can't, you can't choose to use both at the same time. Um, or, you know, but I think it, the question is obviously whether that client does fall within Tom's based on Sonder, um, or not. Um, obviously, we don't know the answer to that on the face of it, but I think if someone didn't meet the the criteria before the Sonder case was released, and vague, and you know, vaguely that sort of means, I know the leases were probably long; they were probably either furnishing or doing utility bills. Um, then I'd think they probably now could use Tom's. Um, and I think we've got quite a few clients um, or ex clients that have um, done exactly that. And um, they do have long leases; they pay utility bills; they may furnish some of their properties. Um, where that's the case, I think we'd probably be saying to them, look, it's there's probably a good argument for Tom's going forward, but we'd probably still want to work to get as much um, sort of gone in terms of material alteration as possible. So, you know, if they've, if they've got all these things that they were doing um, that previously HMRC had said does not meet the Tom's definition, can we at least work on some of them? Um, if that business decided to go ahead and just use Tom's based on just this case, I would say it's still a risk personally um, for the for the reasons I've given that HMRC could do a lot. They could um, appeal, they can, sort of, you know, seek to impose something post-Brexit that doesn't work. They could just sort of turn around, given that it's an FTT case, they can just turn around so your circumstances aren't the same. Um, and, you know, it, it's quite a, a big leap to go from, from doing everything that HMRC advised not 
to saying right we're just going to use toms with no change at all um what we'd probably say to to those businesses is there's probably a lot more scope to use toms even though before you sort of didn't really meet all the criteria hmrc wanted um but we'd still advise you know doing as much as possible to get it into a sort of you know good shape uh, for toms um, the other answer is, um, can we just submit a backdated claim? Um, submitting a backdated claim to HMRC and sort of saying, look, we didn't think we could use TOMS because of either something you previously said or something we previously heard. Um, based on this Sonder case, we think you're wrong. We think we should have been using TOMS for the last four years. Um, so here you go. Here's a, an error notification for four years. This is what you owe us. Now, I think... That's- is, sorry, that's one of our questions. Is that the limit? Four years is how far we could. So if we now, det- I think the question is basically, if we now determine that the business should have been using TOMS mm-hmm. um, and it, it should, how far back can a recalculation be done? Is that four years from what you've four just years, Yeah. Unless you had, if HMRC have come back and said something in the past, um, otherwise, then there is potential for um to go back further um depending on what hmrc have said so basically if hmrc have um said something and been wrong before there is potential scope to go back and and revisit that period as well um but only in certain circumstances so yeah for most people it'll be four years um to go back but yeah i think that is what i would probably advise for um for businesses who have had any sort of run-ins with hmrc before um is to submit a backdated claim i'd even advise it for people who haven't had a run-in and just decided that they shouldn't have been using toms and it's not worth the risk that's a fairly well it's an almost total risk-free way um of of making sure that you know hmrc almost give you a ruling in a sense um that um that yeah that you can use going forward so that's what we will be um looking at for some of our clients um because i think they do meet the circumstances to uh, to have a look um and there's no particular you know criteria i mean i'm not going to say anyone could just sort of you know stick in a claim um but if you genuinely feel that your circumstances are um similar if not identical to the sonder um case and you sort of think well it's worth submitting a claim to hmrc um on a backdated basis um, it won't be a, a quick answer. It never is with HMRC and it definitely isn't when it comes to TOMS. Um, but putting in a claim, um, you know, now um, means that you sort of, you know, if you don't hear for a few months or well, sometimes a lot more than a few months, um, it still means that you've, um, you know, you've lodged it and you've, you've sort of got the right then to that sort of four years worth of, of um, savings. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it's... Um, I suppose in in summary on that point, I think, yes, we would still be fairly risk averse. If you get a written ruling from HMRC or approval of a backdated claim, that pretty much means that for your business, that's almost, I'm not going to say as good as getting a tribunal ruling specifically for you, um, but it gives you a really good um, position because it means that HMRC have looked at your your position and um, and sort of said that you can use it. And the other thing that happened this week, um, I would say, is that um, we we actually heard from HMRC um, about a client who is using the sort of two company strategy. Um, HMRC have been fully briefed on exactly what's happening and they've had their repayment repro- approved from it. So we're quite happy. It's completely, I'm not going to say unrelated to, to the Sonder case. It may have exactly been because of the Sonder case, um, but the timing just so happened to be um, the same. Um, I think it is probably coincidence in this case. Um, but um, but yeah, it just means that um, we are, are getting a number of, of different sort of ways to use TOMS uh, for service departments going forward. Um, but yeah, I think we would always still advise um, in limiting the risk to your business. I don't know why you wouldn't want to. Um, you know, everyone wants to sleep at night, so including us. <laughs> so we're always very risk averse with our clients. Um, but um, but yeah, I think that's that's basically um, the crux of it. I think the message there is that it's great news um, for everyone. Um, I think it gives us a lot more flexibility going forward um, with the use of TOMS and service departments. I think it gives people opportunities to look at um, TOMS going forward um, when they're not able to meet maybe all the conditions HMRC imposed before. Um, but I still advise um, a little bit of, um, you know, risk aversity and not just kind of freely applying toms for everything um because because of the risks that um are around 
Um, do we have any further questions? Oh, we've got quite a few actually. We've got some okay. good ones. Um, okay. I've tried to I've tried to kind of chuck the questions in that have come through at yeah, the right of course. point. Um, so very very briefly. Um, so this was referring to the gentleman that um, is an agent. So he charges that as an agent, but doesn't charge that on his commissions. Is that the correct position? Um, I don't know how you would do that. Um, so if you were acting as a managing agent, then you should never charge that on anything apart from your own services. Um, okay. If if you're charging that on the, the sort of accommodation itself, then that's not really up to you. It's up to the landlord. Um, so if you're genuinely acting as an agent, then you shouldn't be charging VAT on anyone else's supply of um, accommodation. Okay. Um, they would only charge VAT on their supply if they're VAT registered and their circumstances permit it. That's not up to you, but you should charge VAT on your commission. OK. Mm. Right. OK. So, yeah, that might be worth um, that might be worth Graham contacting us. OK, I think we've kind of gone through those. Um, next one. So we've got so may I ask, uh, renting a property under a service accommodation. Would it be classed as a land related service? And do I charge output that to my landlord who is based in Israel? Um, well, yeah, first of all, renting a property is a land related service. Um, obviously, when it when it becomes Tom's, it becomes Tom's instead. But if you're renting it from a landlord, um, then that is a land related service. Um, but I don't know why you'd be charging output of that if you're renting. So if you're renting something that, you know, that's a purchase by you. Um, so um, I don't really understand, if I'm honest. Okay. Um, should the, if the landlord, if the landlord's based in Israel and they're renting a property to you in the UK, um, then it's a UK supply because the land is based in the UK. Okay. However, if they're renting under a, a sort of AST or company let, then it would normally be exempt. So they wouldn't normally have to charge you output that. But I don't think, um, I don't know why you would be charging output okay. that, um, to your landlord because you're not making an, a supply to your landlord. But, um, but yeah, so I think they probably, um, I don't know who that person is because it's anonymous, but I think yeah. um, they would probably like, they probably need to have a look at their contracts um, right. to decide who's doing what. Yeah, I think from, you know, my experience of of, of having you as my wife and <laughs> dealing with the types of clients I deal with and me having a lack of knowledge, the contracts do seem to be the thing that you mention most with all of our, our mm -hmm. clients that we currently have. Yeah. Um, so that's that one. Um, so again, I think we sort of had this question earlier um, and I think you basically said there'd be a bit of a payoff between the two and it was, would buying furniture for the service department be classed as material alteration and when can I claim back the VAT on it? And I think you mentioned earlier that there would almost be a bit of a payoff, wouldn't there? Yeah, I mean, I think, as I've sort of said throughout, um, I think buying furniture in Sonder's case didn't um, yeah. have material alteration, but I think I'd probably earn the side of caution with it. Um, but I think um, if you are going to buy furniture and, and do you take the risk that under Sonder it's OK, um, then I'd probably say, yes, it's, it's probably better to leave it off your um, uh, Tom's calculation to have the don't include it as a direct cost in your Tom's calculation, um, but um, reclaim the input VAT on it. Um, that would probably be my um, preference because strictly under law, the direct cost should only be off the travel service itself. And, uh, you know, furniture obviously isn't a travel service. So, um that would be my preference but it's it's not really been done before so um yeah I think um again it's a gray it depends area oh perfect I think we've done that um I think we've sort of answered Isaiah's question about the the rates and the water and the the um gas and electricity and stuff like that um the only other couple of questions we had um I said, I said it'd be easy for landlords to include the rates and water in the rent yeah um I mean, yeah, as I said, it'd be easier for and this is what we have this two companies um, set up so that the prop co can um, take the rent and prop co can sort of add um, you know, the, the rent and the rates and utilities and everything um, together and, and package it up in a sort of complete rental package to um, the opco from was resale. But um, yeah, I think normally um, that isn't the case with a, a sort of ultimate landlord wouldn't provide yeah. the uh, the light and heat so yeah and as I said I'm, I'm guessing that Sonda probably didn't um ha have that in their supplies from landlords but um 
yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that um, in there. But again, I think it is just a case of kind of flexibility um, and, and making sure that if you're going to, you know, I suppose, whereas before I'd say if you're getting things from landlords, um, if you're renting from landlords and then you're paying the utilities itself, I'd say it's a blanket. No, I don't think Tom's would apply. Whereas now I'd sort of say, well, it's a bit dubious because, you know, utilities wasn't mentioned. Um, but even so, um, you know, it's an arguable point. I'm sure Sonder probably did pay the utilities. So if that's the only point that's not in your favour, then, you know, it, it's perhaps a risk, risk worth, worth taking. But I think every case is different. And, um, yeah, obviously, um, it's it's always useful to take advice. Um, we, I think a lot of you have had consultations with us um, anyway. We still offer our one-hour consultations um, at our discounted rate. Very happy to obviously, um, you know, assist um, anyone with with those um and I, but I think it is useful to talk through um things for your direct um situation rather than in general because everyone has a different type of you know contract with their landlord and with their guests um so yeah obviously if you would like to um uh take on a consultation and just sort of let us know let Paul know actually because he'll he's the one with the uh, the power to book everyone in um so uh yeah um the only power i do have <laughs> i think um i think just before because i can see we're starting to lose people because obviously people have got other things to do um last two questions uh one from sean was what about insurance is that a material alteration and then the second one was from joe uh when operating under tom's at what point do you have to become that registered so Okay. Two point, last two points and those shows everybody I think are the last two questions almost yeah and then we need to we need to shut it off anyway because we've uh, we've all got to go um but um but yeah so um uh charges for consultations um we charge so discount rate we charge 200 pounds plus fat um for an hour's consultation um uh, where you get me for an hour um for whatever questions you may have um the point about toms and registration yeah it's a really good point under toms you only register for vat when your direct margin goes over the vat threshold not the whole selling price so that's actually a really good point it's a shame we didn't mention that earlier um but um we yeah so people who are not yet registered if you qualify under toms you only need to register once your margin goes over eighty five thousand, um rather than your direct selling cost that potentially buys you many more months um of uh vat free um and um uh toms would have to rent directly from the landlords does the land does the, does the landlord have to be individual can they be a limited company yeah they can be either that, that doesn't that doesn't really matter to us um so that's um that's hopefully fine okay well thank you very much everyone for joining us i hope you found that useful um obviously we are available um for um you know whatever you need just email us um normally email paul because he's a uh, He's less um, clogged up on calls than I am. Not say clogged on. I like my calls, but um, but yeah. So um, do let us know um, if you'd um, if you'd like any help. Um, I really hope that this uh, decision has been um, a, a real um, relief for you all, and that you can all celebrate, um, and hopefully that your businesses will really benefit from it. Um, yeah, have a great weekend, uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>